Hey, thank you very much, Besides Dundee. It's fabulous, isn't it? What a great building. Um, my name's Callum Wilson. Uh, I have my, uh, my CV. It's really, you can look at it on LinkedIn. Basically, I look, I've worked for the absolute worst people you can possibly think, think of in government. And yes, three letter and four letter, four letter acronyms and fintech and so on. But today I'm talking to you about television. Um, I work for, uh, Sea Eagle. We've got a team together which is a combination of the broadcast tech, the people who actually build studios and build outside broadcast, and security people. And we've built um, things like um, Ogbené Celebration studio sets. And this, what we're going to do in this talk is actually look behind the scenes of how TV broadcast works and how you can hack into it. Um, there's one of our uh, engineers on the Graham Norton set, just a little bit of a uh, thing, and also um, Formula One, uh, Formula E as well. So, who hands up who has watched television in the last week? That's not as many people as I thought. So television could include Netflix and, right, okay, right, so we all watch TV, right? Gee, hard audience, this. <laughs> so we pretty much w watched TV except for you. So uh, hands up. Well, keep your hands up. Come on. Keep your hands up. Okay. Put your hand down if you haven't watched TV news. So if you've watched TV news, keep your hand up. All right. So it's about half-half. So you watch uh, live um, TV. Well, for those who don't, this is going to be kind of interesting. For those that do, you're going to see behind the, the scenes. But before we go on a little story about hacking uh, TV news... Uh, normal disclaimers apply, um, because you'll end up being on the news if you hack the news. Um, let's have a little look back and see how it all started. So the first uh, TV broadcast in Scotland was actually on the Queen's coronation in 1953. The BBC erected a crane near East Kilbride, which had the TV transmitter on, and they actually broadcast a test card for two days. And you've got to bear in mind that no one had ever seen a TV before. So you had to get the TV and tune it into the test card and then get it working. This actually, uh, for my family, was kind of important because uh, my grandfather had an electrician shop in West Kilbride over on the West Coast, and uh, he bought a Bush TV 22A, which is the only TV you could get at the time, and actually put it in his uh, shop. That's the actual TV there. And the reason it's in my front yard is because I was going to bring it today, but it kind of went on fire. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, they wouldn't let me. So that's actual TV, and he had 50 people in the shop watching that TV, the Queen's Coronation, and then again in the evening, another 50 people to watch the, the actual repeat. And there it is, there's the inside of it. Now, it's actually a pretty dangerous thing, you, and you never, ever, ever do this. Take the back off an old TV, because there's grease, and these are actually valves. This is, so this is before microprocessors came along, and you can just see that they're glowing orange. That was the precursor to fire. Um, <laughs> so with 50 people, now this is a lovely big LG screen here, and very nice. How big do you think that actually is for 50 people watching it? Yeah, yeah, it's that size. That's the size of the screen. Just a little bit bigger than a postcard. And uh, so that's how TV broadcast started in, in Scotland. But that wasn't the start of TV broadcast in the UK. They actually um, started in 1930s. These are the first few frames of the broadcast. Obviously, they had the camera pointing in the wrong direction. This guy in the white jacket was the very first part uh, of when it, when it started. So, but t TV's different. Um, I'm sure some of you have done some pen tests of mostly fintechs and banks and pharmacies and hospitals and stuff like that, and you can break into them. Really, you go home, the next day you break into somewhere else. But TV is different. It's got heart and soul. You are... The people you watch, this is, the, this is um, a Coronation Street, which is, for those of you uh, who don't know, is a, has been the longest running uh, soap drama in the UK. But the characters involved in that are close to you. These are long running programs you get involved in. Look at the number of, tweet, number of people tweeting about Love Island or any of the sort of soaps and so on. TV is something that's cultural. It's, it's something that goes with you as a, as a culture. And so uh, when we start talking about hacking into TV stations, it's different. It's not like breaking into your bank. It's, it's, a, it's a different thing. You can affect a lot of people by hacking into a TV broadcast. Um, Channel 4 in the UK in the 1980s was the uh, um, 
the first time there was sort of an unregulated um, channel. It was designed that all the commissions had to be external to the channel. It had really edgy, racy, well, soft porn after nine o'clock um, TV. And it was the first, first in the UK uh, to be like that. And that would become important in a moment. Then in the late 1980s, I'm sort of showing my age here. I think I'm a little bit older than most people here. Um, that was when the, most of the t TV channels sort of started to come together. The, it, uh, it, in that time, there were three main alternatives. Sky with its mini dish, Squareal from BSB, and a company called On Digital. There's a, there was a story I was going to tell about this, but uh, our lawyers said I should, probably shouldn't. I'm just lucky that the URL for the Guardian on this uh, story is just hanging off the bottom there. But basically, there were allegations that one of these companies um, hacked into one of the other companies and got the root key of the on digital uh, cards, which uh, is a long story. You can read about it in the Guardian. But basically, what happened is you started to see these on digital cards been uh, sold in market stalls. And what happened was this was a terrestrial uh, digital TV product which allowed pay-per-view channels so that you could then pay on the, using the smart card and you could then see the channels. And if, of course they arrived next to nothing in all the markets through sort of uh, naughtiness and they went out of business very, very quickly after that. Some of the very early um, digital TV boxes had a smart card, a little drawer on them. They don't anymore, and that's because of the failure of that. These two companies ended up um, joining up together. That's why it's called B Sky B. It's the sort of amalgamation of, of those two. Uh, streaming in the UK started off with a BBC project, um, like all government-funded projects. Spent a lot of money putting this together. In 2007 was this when the iPhone first came out. You couldn't actually watch iPlayer on an iPhone. iPhone wasn't um, powerful enough. It didn't have a good, good enough bandwidth. That's the actual page from day one. Um, thank you, uh, Wayback Machine, for that. You may have heard of this company. Um, what are they called? Uh, Net something. Um, they uh, started off as a mail-in DVD service um, and was struggling. Uh, they actually tried to sell themselves to Blockbuster. Does anyone not know who Blockbuster is? Yeah, you're all claiming you do. Basically, in the old days, you had to rent videos for the weekend and put them through a little post box on a Monday morning. And if you forgot, you had to pay extra money for it. So they started with that, but they deleted their customer database, pretty much invalidating the whole business, and so had to pivot onto streaming. Um, they weren't, which is quite lucky for them because they've done quite well, I've heard. Um, <laughs> stranger things have happened. So there was actually a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, Stranger Things is actually saving them at the moment from people re uh, removing their subscriptions. There was actually another um, mail-in DVD service that went on to greater things called Love Films. Anyone know who they became? Amazon Prime. Well done. So yeah, so there was funny how the two biggest streaming services we have in the UK at the moment both started from mail-in DVDs. But TV also can be used for other things. It's a, it's, it's a great way of getting oppressive messages across. Um, we've seen television, especially news broadcasts, which is what I'm going to focus on today, being used for other things, polit uh, political. Even in the UK right now, you're seeing politicians standing up quite regularly in front of TV, telling their stories, um, but also being used in international matters. Uh, and there's nothing more powerful than this message. This is TV Rain in Russia, where the whole crew got in front of the camera and effectively said goodbye and walked off. Now, I think most of you probably heard of that. That You may have seen it in all the Twitter noise and so on. But um, you definitely wouldn't have heard of someone doing that on a YouTube channel or a stomping off in a big huff. Uh, it doesn't happen. But when it happens on broadcast TV, people um, pay attention. So we come on to hacking. Let's talk a little bit about hacking. The, the one of the first broadcast TV hacks, and I'm not going to talk about you know Game of Thrones script being stolen, the kind of media film stuff. I'm talking about broadcast things that are actually getting broadcast. This is the this was a fictional character called Max Hedrum, and Max Hedrum actually, funny enough, came from Channel Four. Channel Four, being edgy, had this um, really new down with the kids. Apparently, that was the terminology of the time. Uh, character who would be, you know, do his thing. 
WGN TV in Chicago, uh, which WGN stands for World Greatest News, we're running a nine o'clock news sports program, basically uh, a couple of presenters behind a desk telling about the local um, sports when this suddenly came on, just basically just came on straight over the top of the TV. And you've, it's actually funny enough, as I was building this um, this this deck for today at B-Sides, uh, there's been a few YouTube videos come out about this, which you may have seen, but we can. I'm going to go into a little bit more depth than they have. Um, so this was a 15 second clip that went straight over the top of the broadcast. And then about two hours later, past 11 p.m., another channel, which was a, uh, now the Americans in the room can keep me right here, public broadcaster PBS service, and we're just showing a, an episode of Doctor Who. And then there was a 90-second um, uh, video where Max Redrum here got spanked by a lady in, uh, anyway, whatever. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people were sort of saying, well, how does this happen? So we'll talk about that. And then why did it happen? So this is signal hijacking. So in Chicago, um, the broadcast TV antenna, it was on, a, on top of a large building. And if you know the center of Chicago, there's a lot of tall buildings. And so in those days, they just used microwave point-to-point -point dish. And these guys taped a, a video just like that and then stood on top of a tall building and used a much higher power signal to be able to um, essentially overwrite, if you like, the broadcast signal. Now, the inverse square law means you just have to be closer to the to this part here, to the antenna, in order to take over the signal. Um, what the there's been a lot of guesswork about who this guy was. Um, he we think he must have been an insider because in the 1980s it would have been quite a big trick to pull off. You would have needed a lot of insider information for exactly what frequency and where this was. You would have had to even a, a camera lens to film broadcast TV uh, is about 50 grand with another 150 grand for the back. Then you've got all the equipment to be able to um, to broadcast and so on. You could sort of do it with some rookie uh, antenna hardware and a dish, just if you're really, really close. But we think this was somebody probably uh, well acquainted with the industry and potentially um, an ex, uh, ex employee of one of the TV stations, because actually the dialogue mentions WGN a couple of times. But what the other pundits have never said um, is that why did he hit WGN TV and then carry on with the diatribe against WGN TV on another channel? Well, that's because this link here is a pay for service. It costs quite a lot of money, actually. And so what would have happened is that the uh, WGN would have been using the main um, dish and communication or distribution link, as it's called, during the uh, 9 o'clock news, which is a lot of viewers. And the Doctor Who has been shown on the other channel after 11 p.m. when things tend to quieten down. And so what happened was the um, they would have actually been using different broadcast frequencies. And so it just so happened that the other channel happened to be on the frequency where they were before. So all that happened is that the hackers here basically rebroadcast on the same frequency, but it went onto a different channel because it was actually the frequency of this link just here. Uh, that hasn't been that hasn't come up in any of the um, Reddit or any of the big investigations that have gone into this. Uh, the FCC uh, and the FBI tried to find this character, but uh, they never did, and it's been quite a long time now, so no one's ever come up to admit to it. I'm not going to go through every single TV uh, thing. I'm just going to choose some of my favorites. This was the Czech Republic in 2007. They had an IP camera that just sort of swept left and right behind their weather forecast. I mean, why wouldn't you? So some artists looked at the hills and thought, I don't know where that is, hiked out into the woods, basically got the camera and put another chip in it with their own video, which included an atomic bomb going off. Um, let's call it art, shall we? Uh, and it filled, filled absolutely no one, and they broadcast it twice. Uh, so to, I don't know who was actually awake in the studio at that point, but um, they actually got, got arrested and got in quite a lot of trouble for that, just for that, just be put in the background for a, uh, a news weather uh, thing. Coming up to a little bit more up to date, you'll have seen some of these. There was um, some satellite hacks uh, in some of the areas in Ukraine. This is an EPG hack, Electronic Program Guide. Every time you go on your TV, whether you've got satellite or Virgin Media or you've got um, uh, terrestrial TV, a pro there's a program guide that follows a certain standard. In this case, um, an anti-war message was replacing the... Um, 
the, uh, the, the name of the show. Uh, I'm not going to go into the politics of it because that's not what I'm here for, but I will say how we think it was actually done. So when you're actually producing a TV channel, you need to schedule all your programs. And that tends to be done uh, inside the organization, and then you send it out to um, collation, and then onto the distribution mechanisms, which could be satellite, terrestrial TV, or whatever. Um, the number of stars are the hardest to hack. So this is actually pretty hard to hack. That's you know, a wee bit hard. That's absolutely piss easy. And uh, let's uh, have a look at one, shall we? So um, our company have done a lot of different, a lot of work with um, TV broadcasters, and we've come across the scheduler apps um, quite a bit. And there's one we've actually hacked a number of times. Uh, I I spoke to the team and said, should we reveal who it was? And they said, no. So uh, let's just call it the scheduler app. This one was really easy. It was a directory traversal attack. Uh, I think some of the other speakers have talked about this kind of thing. There were actually other attacks on this particular um, app. And um, in that, when we did the config, we found the database password quite memorable. If you can remember five numbers in order, starting with one. And of course, once you've got into your uh, database for the scheduler, you can then start messing around, you know. And also, we found things like, oh, look, there's all the user table. Wait a minute. Anything unusual there? They all got the same password. <laughs> so really, you get a lot of control failures. And what's happened here is that the a lot of the broadcast technology was designed for in-studio. And this stuff is out facing the internet. It's just never designed for it. And so it's quite simplistic application attacks, like a directory traversal, and then um, into the database, you can start messing around and TV, changing TV channel names, whatever your um, you know purpose is, whether it's political, you know, uh, or for lulls or for the lulls, you know, if like Max Hedrum or for the artists, and that's really how the, it's really for attention. You're going to hack TVs for attention. A lot of people, in, especially in when I work in fintech, they say security is all about security of data. In live broadcast, there is no data angle because once it's broadcast, it's open and free. So they don't care. So it's really about, um, you know, embarrassment factor and so on. This is the event information table uh, the e from the EPG, and you can see that uh, these are basically mandatory variables with a whole bunch of extra variables depending on which platform you use. It's got stuff like, you know, uh, can kids watch it and so on and so forth. If you're interested in this kind of thing, I can recommend an um, app called TS Duck. Um, if you get TS Duck, you can it's, get a DVB a digital video broadcast receiver, USB, into your laptop. They only cost a few quid from, e from eBay or from Amazon. Put a decent antenna on it, and you can start actually um, sucking in all the TV data, which is not just the picture, the video, but actually all the information behind it, which is all this stuff. And this actually goes on for a lot more data, and you can start messing around with it, and you can also replay it. Uh, be careful you replay it, because you will be committing an offense, uh, especially if you change people's broadcast in your locality. Um, the um, TV channels in the UK, these are terrestrial TV channels. There's a really good website called Digital Bitrate, where it has all of European, Russian, North African channels and what the actual frequencies are. So here we are in Dundee today. There's a big antenna just to the north of here called Angus. And it's all the TV channels are basically collected together in what's called a multiplex. So in the old days, um, in analog TV, each channel will have its own frequency. And then when digital switchover happened in the early 2000, uh, 2012, was it? I can't remember. Anyway, in the 2000s, they started bunching some of the channels together so they could get more channels in for the same frequency range. And you can see the HD channels, there's way less in that multiplex than there is in the commercial channel. So that's COM4, that's commercial 4, and this is public sector broadcaster, PSB, which is mostly BBC stuff. Um, where you are in the UK, you won't actually all get the same channels. I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but they're actually look, uh, local changes. So Oxford has its own TV station, London Live. Uh, there used to be way more local channels, but some of them have sort of fallen to, uh, to the side. And also you get in so different regions. So, for example, if you've got a TV, if you're lucky enough to live in, say, the west coast of Scotland, you can actually tune into Ireland, to Northern Ireland, or you can tune into the... Um, into the Glasgow area and get different TV channels. So it's not all exactly the same within the UK. And you can see all this information. You get all the information down here from uh, digitalbitrate.com. So when you're programming your TS duck with a DVB USB key, you can really, really uh, have a bit of fun. Here we are. We're about here. Uh, where are we? About there. 
Uh, there's a massive antenna on a hill up there, and these are the um, free mini free view antennas. There's one across the other side. So this big antenna here is on top of a hill and gets a big range, and these guys down here just fill in some of the gaps, especially in where the river is, and they just rebroadcast on a, on a different frequency. Uh, you can look at that on ukfree.tv and it gives you all the information, especially if you're not getting a good signal with your TV. So, the newsroom. Um, this TV station just launched uh, a few months ago. Uh, it's uh, quite interesting because they, they actually show some of the background and we want to talk a bit about the background of TV broadcast. And uh, this is just on a reel here. You'll see that you'll, um, you've got the presenter in a studio with a big graphics display behind it. There only are a few companies that sell the graphics displays. There'll be typically um, some sort of rolling text along the bottom. There's only a few companies that do that. And you'll see in the actual gallery, the gallery is where the director sits and where sound. So you've got a sound mixer. You've got somebody preparing scripts and sending packages and putting packages together and trying to get the whole thing as a fluid news item. When you're watching news, you'll find that actually they only focus a camera on a particular person or a package for around about 8, 8 to 15 seconds. Now that I've told you that, it ruins every single time you watch the news. Um, it flicks around all the time. There's people controlling that. And that's what all these screens are. They've got all the feeds coming in for sound and so on and actually um, doing that. One of our, we were just, I was um, playing this to uh, the rest of the, our uh, team. And they were horrified to see a green smoothie sitting on the desk with the, uh, in the, chap in the uh, director's hand because that can cause hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of damage. So uh, I was being told that if you ever spill a drink in a gallery, there it is there, um, they always ask, is it Coke? Because if it's Coke, they'll go and get a bucket of water and pour it over live electronics because it will actually save it. Uh, whereas sludgy stuff like that will kill it instantly. That's just an aside. So if you're ever hacking into a TV broadcaster, take a can of Coke. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know, many of you probably work in finance and pharmacy and, you know, these kinds of organizations. And when you're protecting an organization, you're looking at Linux, Windows, cloudy stuff, database platforms, Kubernetes, and that kind of thing. You can probably get agents for all of this and do your compliance scans off the shelf and attach them into your agents for your security uh, operations center and so on. You can't do that in TV broadcast. Uh, they have those sites of systems, but they also got all of this. The TV broadcast industry is different. It um, uses hardware for particular purposes. It doesn't run on commoditized um, systems. Apart from that database I showed you earlier. So when you've got all of this type of equipment, you start looking at the old school uh, hacks. And you look at the 1930s to 1980s. Most broadcasters operated within a studio, and they would have something called a broadcast network with point-to-point -point connections, typically big, thick copper connections. And if you worked in this uh, studio, you stood next to the thing that you're watching. So cameras, media control, the new system. New system is designed. It's like so you can put all the material and packages and script and all the add-ons for a particular package all together so they can play it out at any time. So when you look at the news, they will typically talk for a while, and then there'll be a package of you know, and here's uh, Sally and, you know, looking at the weather or whatever, you know, or on the beachfront somewhere. Uh, and all the various things, even the lighting changes. A lot of studios have uh, different types of lighting and coloring that's all tuned for the TV cameras. And so if you're going to do another show in the same studio, you can make it look entirely different. And also we'll have uh, a back panel of um, typically big, big screens. So you can completely change the look and feel of a, a studio. Then in the... Um, sort of 1990, 2007, the news started to become different. So in the old days, you'd get a script. It'd be the same newscast, newscast. You'd just see them read it from beginning to end, and that'd be the end of the news. Then they started moving to more package system, where they would say, they'd start reading the news article, then they'd clip to somebody else, show a package, which is just a media pre-prepared media clip, and then go back to the studio. And so journalists started to occupy more of the news studio, and so they needed IP connections into here. So it's your classic primitized network problem. So once there was a primitized network, suddenly you're getting holes punched through to allow the journalists who are on another floor of the building or in another part of the building to be able to get access. And then you'll notice 2017, after that, it starts getting a little bit nastier. So in the last few years, the whole of the TV broadcast industry has changed really, really quickly. So 
um, a lot of these systems have been replaced with IP so that uh, to allow people to be able to access from home, from tablets and laptops and so on. And the answer to fix this, because this is clearly bridgehead territory, was just to put really crappy solutions in like that. Uh, FTP servers are used quite a lot in media because they they're copying, you know, gigabytes of data around. Never use FTPS, too slow. Um, VPNs, really poor quality ones, and various portals supplied by the manufacturers of this stuff. Um, and then you've got this, this classic primitized network in just a few years is now absolutely um, uh, everywhere. This is a bit about Recon. We talked a bit about Recon and some of the other presentations. Just to show you how bad this is, this is one of those um, edge control vendor products. This actually is a distribution product. I've tried my hard to, hardest to redact the name of it. And uh, it's used to send broadcast from one location to another, and quite a lot of channels use IP. So they'll have a playout server um, just transmitting channels to wherever they need to go, to their distribution, or from studio to studio, or whatever. And this is the main software vendor that does it. And he's going to kick me if I say the name of it. Uh, so quick showdown, if everyone's never used showdown, please have a wee go. And a lot of these tools, because they are vendor produced, have their name all over it and headers and all sorts, very easy to search for. Uh, this is actually a quick screenshot of it. Um, uh, I've tried to redact it as best I can. These tools have a lot of things like, oh, look, you can set up an SSH tunnel uh, straight into the studio. That's really handy. Uh, this was a real one. It's on the internet. Um, it's copyright 2017. It's still before the, the, the move to IP. And what's happened is that um, broadcast technicians have put this out onto the internet facing, typically in Amazon or in Azure or into the endpoint, you know, the, uh, 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 DMZ of uh, companies' networks, when it was never designed for that. And so once you've hacked into this one, uh, you can then start getting access and start uh, pivoting into further into the uh, company and you can start breaking into the other things that we were talking about. It's a really cool website called crt.sh. Um, you know, if you, I've, I just searched for news broadcaster and Google. These are the first three that came up. You might be able to work out who they are. Please don't. Uh, but basically, if you start to see all of the uh, external facing um, endpoints that use the same certificate, because let's face it, everyone puts star.callum.com or whatever and just use the same certificate everywhere. But oh, look, this news organization, S3GW. I wonder what that could be. Um, and then you, I've cut off, but these lists go all the way down and there's lots of really cool stuff. You start to see that these companies where only a few years ago would have had really one or two internet endpoints now have dozens of them, uh, all leaky and uh, ways into the organization. But the biggest thing in broadcast, and it's, it feels like a bit of a con coming to a B-sides to say that actually the biggest problem is hard-coded passwords. It's, uh, but it's one of those things. So the tool that I showed you before, the content distribution tool with SSH tunneling, has a default password, uh, which is one of these ones. <laughs> They're all crap. And quite a lot of uh, the hardware has hard-coded administrator passwords that you cannot change. You can't change the username or the password. Uh, and these, if you're ever looking at these kind of, kind of things, doesn't matter what industry you're in, look for the manuals. The manuals are really helpful and they tell you all this sort of stuff. Uh, and there's a, there's a difference in broadcast. If I stop talking for five seconds, it gets a little bit awkward. If I stop talking for 15 seconds, which I won't do, you'll start getting a bit red and I'll look a bit nervous. But 15 seconds in broadcast, you lose your job. If you go dark air in 15 seconds, don't bother coming back. Even five seconds, you might be lucky to still have a job. So what happens is those people who are sitting in the gallery of all those TV screens mixing in signals from left, right, and center, they're not concerned with security. They're concerned with keeping that broadcast alive because, um, as I said before, data is not important because as soon as you broadcast it, it's public. And so what they'll do is they rely on having default passwords and not just users logging in, but the integrated tools. So when I showed you before, the tool, all the cameras and lighting and everything integrates with each other, they hard code those passwords in. So if you buy vendor B's slow motion uh, replay system, it'll have these passwords all hard coded into them because that's just what everyone uses. So if you are going to try and secure a, uh, a broadcaster studio, you've got a big job on your hand because not only do you have to just change the passwords, the default thing, if you can, you also have to change uh, and make sure all that tallies with all of the um, integrated glue 
uh, they call it glue, which is just the integrations of different systems. So they are so far behind. Um, this is really is what in finance, certainly we've sorted out 20 years ago, but TV broadcasters are having a tough time of it, and you've seen the hacks. Um, we we also use honeypots, and it was really great. Justin's presentation there. We've got a bird. I've never called it that before, which is a pretend version of the uh, the, the one of the content distribution systems, and basically. Uh, because it's starting to get quite well known what the default passwords are, we've got this fellow, and we don't employ anyone in Zhengzhou in uh, China. Um, so it's, we just leave it lo logged on, and then we take those IP addresses because um, our business is basically providing security. It's a security provider for TV broadcast. So we'll just put, uh, run that in and use it as part of our um, intelligence feed for, um, you know, for other customers. So, uh, yeah, that's actually, we use Sentinel if you're interested in that kind of thing. So, we talked a little bit about the hacking, but what I want to do is look at this. Oh, this is one more thing. So, this is, you will have seen this in the news, people doing interviews from their back bedrooms lately. That is brand new. This particular system here is a backpack system from a vendor. Uh, this is a real life uh, studio context. And what, what's happened in the old days, uh, if you had a news issue, you got the local TV company to drive out with their truck with a, satel with a satellite dish on the roof. And then you would pay about 50 grand for 10 minutes for uplink. So then you do your package to camera, next company would come along, do their package to camera and so on. And that's how the, it worked. But you'll remember that in, um, now I'm going to say 20, 18, but I might have my dates wrong. Apologies for that. There was a air aircraft disaster in Germany, Swiss border, where a German wings airplane flew into the mountain. And that was the first time this technology had really been properly used. And what happened was the TV truck from the local TV company got the closest it could on the road, but was still many miles away. So a Good Morning Britain um, journalist with one of these systems, and this is a camera. It's got a, a backpack with six SIMs in it, which connects to the local um, you know, 4G network, and you can actually do live broadcast with it, uh, actually walked through all of the um, woods and uh, got live broadcast. That's the first time this system was ever put in. And you've seen this sort of thing happening, all that broadcast straight into the studio onto that screen, which they can then mix into the, into the broadcast, and then they can have two-way conversations with the studio. Um, that system uses streaming control server and FTP server, both of which have hard-coded uh, credentials, and it has to be on the internet because, you know, so on. So there's a long way to go. And also, this equipment's really expensive, so you tend to rent it from a third party, and when you rent it from a third party, it comes with default credentials because no one's got time to change it. So my favorite hack, uh, we broke into one TV news organization. It wasn't Eurovision. This is Eurovision's uh, headquarters in Luxembourg. It wasn't them because it's just as a wiki commons uh, <laughs> image. But you could actually change the uh, satellites. You can make it swing around and do all that sort of stuff. That had no password at all, so even better. <laughs> when you're looking at news, this is us finishing off. So when you look at news, I don't want you to look at the present. I want you to look behind in the background. They all do it. They all do exactly the same. And in the background, you can probably see me uh, crawling along the floor trying to uh, breach their systems in the background. This is what's actually happening. These aren't just for effect. That's actually real galleries. That's real information that's coming forward. And uh, there's a... Um, you might see Jerry, actually. You've got to, if you are interested in TV broadcast and hacking, then come chat to us later. Be more like Jerry. Um, this is him. Look how happy he is. There he is there. Look how happy he is. That was 2 a.m. Uh, the only time we could get access to the studio and we're doing a, a full... Um, application security review, if you want to call it that, or whatever it is for broadcast. And uh, yeah, that vision mixer there has a hard-coded password. We could change all the buttons. Have a great time. So thanks so much. Oh, we've got time for questions. You chat. Oh, come on. Any questions then? Has anyone been on TV and in front of the camera? I know there's a few earlier been in front of the camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. IP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Arkiva run the um, UK 
terrestrial transmitter system, but you'll have like Sky do their dishes. There's other um, satellites and pointing upwards, by the way. There's other uh, satellite distribution systems. You've got online distribution as well to things like YouTube, live streaming, and so on and so forth, and social media. Um, I think that the bigger the organization it has the most, I think as you get closer to the end point, it gets much uh, better. But you saw, I didn't go into it actually, but in distribution during the conflict in the um, Eastern Europe, um, there's some satellite nodes actually got taken out through various uh, things. So um, I didn't include that because it's quite a lot of material. But yeah, basically in the distribution side, it does actually get attacked as well. And it was one of the terrestrial in Russia was also attacked on the distribution side. So about 50% of a new, if you've got 24-hour rolling news, about 50% is pre-prepared packages. But uh, it, TV's different. TV is about the art. It's about the culture. It's about person-to-person -person, uh, reaction. And so when you go into these places, and when I talk about the, the title is Lulz, Lulz, and lots of makeup, there are people wearing a lot of makeup who will be all nicely dressed and be ready to go on, and they're the people that we come to know and love. Um, yeah, it's just, it's the way TV's been done since the 1930s. Uh, I don't see it changing anytime soon. Yeah. So I spoke to the, I've got a good relationship with the NCSC, and I said, hey, wait, guys, is this not a um, critical national infrastructure asset because media is kind of important? I'm not sure if you've heard. And he went, oh, yeah. It is, isn't it? But we don't look after that. That's the Department of Culture, Media, and Sport. So I went over to the Department of Culture, Department of Culture Media, and Sport and said, hey, see the M in your name? Isn't that like critical intro at TV? And I went, yeah, but you need to speak to the NCSC about that. So basically what, <laughs> what's happening in the UK is there isn't much um, in terms of regular. No, there are, they don't do pen tests and they don't have um, tons of security. They are now because now the embarrassment factor of lo losing broadcast is starting to become important. Also, if you lose broadcast during a advert, you don't get the money. So uh, yeah, so now it's starting to come in. But it's, it's different. Sorry? Yeah, it's, it, yeah, so as you, as I, if you get closer to the transmitter, so Archiva and Sky and so on, that stuff is much better. And, you know, um, Sky has a security operation center. So does Archiva. But the um, broad, actual broadcasters creating the content and actually running the show um, are in a completely different place at the moment. They've just gone through what finance did in the last 20 years and the last two years.